So now that I've presented what we call a hypothesis about this traditional meaning of faith, I'd like to go through a couple examples in the Bible and provide some evidence in support of the hypothesis. We're going to look at one of two men in the Old Testament that God would choose as he scanned the spectrum of history for those that could encourage Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. He couldn't find better than Elijah and Moses. That's Elijah's credentials. That's a high credential. Two witnesses were present at the resurrection. Two witnesses were present at the ascension and said, Why gaze ye up into heaven? This same Jesus you see going away will come again in like manner. Two witnesses were present at his glorification on the Mount of Transfiguration. The two witnesses are named in this event, Elijah and Moses. They're unnamed in the other incidents that they'll bear witness to. I studied the lives of heroes of faith, oh, I'd say 20 years or so. It was an obsession with me to learn about the men whose lives indicated God was a front and center priority to them, and common denominators began to leap out to me. I found that some of these men were going through things just like I'm going through and just like we're going through right now. God's treating what we may call his favorites like he's treating us. I will start out with his credentials. He's chosen by God to stand and encourage Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Now, in that frame, I want to pull Elijah apart and get acquainted with Elijah the man. I don't like to super-spiritualize everything. He was flesh and blood just like you and me. He had the same fear and insecurity and bad judgment that all of us have, the same things that we use to connect to each other with today. And then I want to look, as we have done in the past, with the way God treated Elijah. He didn't start in 1 Kings 17. It doesn't tie in with anything at the end of the 16th chapter, because the last verse of the 16th chapter says some completely unrelated things. With Elijah, then, what's the connection? You'll never know why the beginning is not there without the New Testament, because the New Testament looks back beyond 1 Kings 17 and lets us know where Elijah started. The New Testament says he was a man of like passions as we are. Same flesh and blood as me. Probably got mad when he stubbed his toe, just like me. But where Elijah started is just here. He started by praying earnestly that it might not rain. If we go back to Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 16 to 17, there is a commitment by God in his word. If they ever worshipped idols after he took them into that land, God would shut up the heavens and wouldn't let it rain anymore. So this guy is in the driest place in the land because Elijah lived in Gilead, east of Jordan. Have any of you ever been there? It's drier than West Texas. It's the driest place in the land, and Elijah starts praying that it won't rain. The Bible has its own footnotes to those that pay attention. It's crazy to pray that prayer if you're living in Death Valley. Only one thing makes sense of that prayer, and that is if Elijah was aware of a contradiction between God's word and the circumstances that surrounded him. When God says something, that's it. Now suddenly into this circumstance, a man of faith comes and he encounters in history and time and his surroundings a contradiction. Here on earth, it is not what God's word says it ought to be. At that moment, the opportunity faces this man of faith to accept this contradiction just the way it is and nothing to be done about it. Or he can reach up with the hand of his faithing, grab hold of God's word and start pulling. He acted with prayer on the belief that God's word was absolute and hung in there no matter the circumstance even to the point of harm to himself. It was the driest place in the land, and he was praying for drought. He loved God's word more than his own benefit, and that's what the faithing action is. That's why if your faith is based upon reacting to God, working after the fact, to God sovereignly moving down and shoving aside and shattering the contradictions, you will never be a hero of faith. True faithing acts. It doesn't react. True faithing seizes God's word and says it doesn't matter what the circumstance is. God spoke his word, and nothing became everything. I'm going to put my grip on that which is the causal force rather than the effect. And if I die hanging on to that, I'm still hanging on to the right conductor into eternity because heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will never pass away. And that's what faith in action is. Elijah looked around while he was in the desert. He could have looked at his circumstances and said, God, lead me to an oasis and I'll start praying for it to stop raining when I know there's plenty of water for me. But I find no record of anything that he did other than just start praying that it would stop raining. And he lived in the worst place for that to happen. But that which leaps out about Elijah is his earnest prayer had no footnotes for Elijah's benefit. He didn't say, God, your honor is being called in question because you said something through Moses years ago and you're not doing it yet. I'd like to see you do it, but give me an oasis to hide in while you do it. There's not a hint in his prayer there's something for Elijah. It is all of God. It is an earnest seeking of that which will vindicate God's word. I know there
there are lots of people forever thinking a prayer meeting is magic and there are people that want to hunt out the best prayer meetings, but I've watched them. What they really want to hunt out is a prayer meeting where things happen to them to make them feel good. It's spiritual Prozac. Again, just another way to get something from God for yourself. Now, if Elijah's praying for a drought seems weird to you, I submit that it's not so weird. We all make that prayer all the time. That's what the Lord's Prayer means when it opens with, O Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why would Jesus tell us to pray that prayer? Well, this is what it means. Thy will be done. Hundreds of years before Jesus told his disciples to pray that prayer, Elijah had done so. Elijah starts where every person listening to me right now can start. And that's the point. His first action was simple praying that God would do what God already said he'd do. God's looking for people who care more about God's honor than they do themselves. And as long as you can keep that perspective, you won't have any trouble going on in God. Did God take care of Elijah? He sure did. But there was no insurance policy pre-written sticking in his pocket when he walked into Ahab's court. No indication that he even considered the consequences to himself. It's just simply this issue. God said it. It's not being done. I'm going to pray earnestly that it will happen. If I ask what's the first thing you think of when you think of Elijah, inevitably most will say that he called the fire down from heaven, which consumed the sacrifice on Mount Carmel. If you catch anybody that grew up in Sunday school and you say, what's the first thing David did? They'll say he killed Goliath. Well, no, it isn't. He learned to trust God and rely on God's strength with the lion and the bear before he ever got to Goliath. I see people all the time praying for instant, giant, spiritual attainment in one fell swoop, and it doesn't come that way. Elijah didn't start praying on Mount Carmel. He prayed in the desert, unseen, no crowd looking on, nothing special about this first act. He started in the exact same place we start. If I don't get anything else across about Elijah tonight, I want to get that across to you. This is the way it happens. He didn't even think about the consequences to himself. Elijah cared more about God than he did about himself. So easy to say, so hard to keep doing. I'd hate to tell you how many times in 2020 I bawled God out because in all of his omnipotent power, he could look out for his people and also do a few nice things for me. I'd hate to tell you how many times I'd come back and say to him what I was willing to do for him if he would just look out for his little private thing that I wanted. I'm not the only sinner listening tonight to God's word. We got only one trip down here. And then if he has tested you and worked you over and found out what you care the most about, ask yourself this. Do you care more about God than yourself? He just refused to let circumstance rule. And I keep trying to get flesh and blood on these characters. Don't make a Superman out of this guy. He's a desert rat. When he started, he found God's word saying something and circumstances were denying it. He prayed earnestly. Now he's going to spite the circumstance even more. He gets up and walks into Ahab's court and he hangs his body on God's word. Nowhere did God send him an angel. I challenge any one of you to read Elijah's life. Check every reference anywhere and find anywhere that God spoke to him out of the heavens. He didn't get a burning bush like Moses. There is no record anywhere that God gave him a nudge and said, now's the time to go to Ahab. I believe that I've got as much biblical room for my interpretation as anything else anybody else lays down. I believe he simply read it in God's word, saw the circumstance, and earnestly prayed until something clicked inside him, and he decided now's the time to put my body on the line. I'm going to march right into the king's court and make myself the available instrument for God's word to come to pass. And he says to the king, it isn't going to rain any more until I speak rain. Up to that point, Elijah didn't do anything that anybody else couldn't do. I got to admit, I'm not sure with all my years faithing, I'd be ready to march down to Gavin Newsom and tell him it wouldn't rain anymore until I said rain. I'm not sure I'd even go to born again Trump with that one. Most of our steps of faith do not call for quite as big a leap, but that's exactly the way this giant God began. He did not seek some spiritual revelation. He put himself on the line and having prayed earnestly that God would do what he had already said he would do with concern for God. God's honor, his faith was in action. He marched out of Gilead into the king's court and said it wasn't going to rain anymore. And it didn't. That's the good part. But I'm still pulling this character apart. I'm just looking at him like a flesh and blood human being. There's nothing here that you can't do. Richard Worsley said he was more aware of God's presence than any other reality. I want you to see that. Another bishop of the Middle Ages wrote a book entitled Practicing the Presence of God, and I think that title is wrong. You don't practice God's presence. Like it or lump it, no matter what you practice, he's present. That's what omnipresence means. You're not going to determine God's presence by your practice. The psalmist said in Psalm 139, verse 7, Whither shall I go from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art 
start there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, get the picture? God is present no matter what you or I practice. What we need to practice is a disciplined awareness of his presence. Elijah is characterized by a disciplined practice, recognized ever-present awareness of an unseen presence. And his practice of that presence up to this point calls for as much blind disciplined faith as you and I are asked to perform. Now, I'm quite sure after the fire fell on Mount Carmel, it'd be a little easier to carry on this practice. But the man that started out comes from Gilead, aware of God's word, concerned for God's honor, practice, and faith. But everywhere he goes, you can see he's got a disciplined awareness of someone else that's with him. He comes upon the widow gathering sticks in 1 Kings 17, and he's such a man of God. Conversation inevitably turns to God, and that's a compliment. Anybody who believes in God, when you bring up the subject, can spit out the creed. When Elijah showed up and the widow was made to think about it, she had the right idea. She said, the Lord thy God liveth. She recognized he was alive. I submit that 99% of Christians in the country go through 99% of their days, and the only time they really intensely make themselves aware of God's presence with them is when a crisis demands it, or somebody brings up the subject. It's not a practice discipline. The King of Kings has promised never to leave us or forsake us, and we go through most of our days ignoring him until a crisis fixes our attention on him, or a man of God or a spiritual service moves into our sphere and brings the subject up. When that happens, here comes the creed. Sure, I know God lives. Well, whoop de doo Quit ignoring him. Elijah came upon Obadiah, the man who hid the prophets in a cave. The same thing happens. Obadiah says, as the Lord thy God liveth. And that's also a compliment. Elijah's presence not only brought up thoughts about God, but they also knew right away Elijah was a man of God. What made Elijah different? You read it closely in that chapter of 1 Kings 17, and Elijah says the same thing. I know God lives, but what's the difference? It's the part where he says, for whom I stand. You find the widow saying that, and I'll give you 10 bucks. You find Obadiah saying that, I'll give you another 10. God was part of their creed, but Elijah recognized there was an audience, and he only played for that one audience. I hope one of these days I only play all the time to one audience. The Lord God of Israel for whom I stand. Every one of us can practice that awareness. Christianity is not a bunch of rules. There's no bucket full of creeds. It's not the practice of any rituals. It's a living, vital, walking relationship with the Lord and Master who died for you, buys you, and possesses you. You're his bond slave and at his beck and call every moment when you come to that awareness. God can use you. And there's not a person of God listening to me anywhere that can't do that. What's so super spiritual about that? Nothing. Now, how God treats you, you'd think that if anybody, this disciple of God, Elijah, would get some real nice treatment from the Lord, wouldn't it? But I would hazard a guess that some of you, just like me, you've forgotten how true it is in the life of a person. God led Elijah one step at a time. You know, that's what's killing me. If God would show me in a vision all the things he's going to do for me, I'd just burn up the internet with these messages. I have never had any trouble with God's will if he tells me the second step when he's telling me the first step. It's just too much to ask anybody to trust God might know what's around the bend. Tell me that second step so I can trust you. The hardest part of faithing in God's will is this. If you want to know God's will, don't ever take a step in uncertainty. Some some people's way of finding God's will is to say, well, God hasn't told me anything. I don't know where to go, but I'm going to make him have to do something and then leap off a cliff to tempt God. Sometimes he catches. It's one step at a time. Look at Elijah. God's word said the heavens would shut up. He prayed that that would happen, and he went to Ahab's court to hang himself on God's word, and that's all he knew. He didn't know the second step. Not a word from God came where to go until after he delivered that word to Ahab. You know, this is the first record of a special revelation. It's the first record in God's book of a special revelation. Everything else he did was an action based upon the general word of God available to every person. If you spend the rest of your life just doing what God's book tells you to do and never get a special revelation, I'd put my money on you being on safer ground than the special revelation people. I'm unimpressed with the people that God tells them when to get up, what breakfast cereal to buy, what color to paint their house, when to buy a car, and everything they do. Not until he was in Ahab's court did he get another direction from God. Then the word of the Lord came and said, leave here, turn east, and hide and carry the ravine east of Jordan. What's the next step? Number one was he went into Ahab's court because the written word of God could be carried out there. Now the next message, God says, go to Kareth. He goes to Kareth because God says, it shall be that thou shalt drink the brook and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there.
Elijah might have said, well, now, wait a minute. I want to go to the River Jordan. I don't want to go to Kareth. And I have no problem picturing God answering, well, be my guest, but the birds are flying to Kareth. I've commanded the ravens to feed you there. God doesn't have as much trouble with them birds as he does with us Christians. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord. He went and dwelt by the brook Kareth, that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening. And he drank of the brook. Now, here's where it gets tough. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. (laughs) You get that? Acting on God's word created a mess for him. His obedient action and God's carrying out what he asked him to do was drying up the very brook God gave him. He heard it gurgle and it became a little bit of water and damp sand, then nothing. What do you think went through his mind as he sat there and finally the last day he came? No more damp sand. Do you think that the birds will be here in the morning? Probably not. But when it was a trickle, the test of faith was there. But God gave him no early warning signals. All he had from God is, go to Kareth. I've given you a brook and birds going to fly morning and evening. Are you seeing the pattern here? Getting how this relates to the meaning of faith I've been telling you about? When does he get his next signal? It came to pass after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. And the word of the Lord came unto him saying, Arise and get thee to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and live there. Behold, I've commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. Nowadays he'd have to worry about, Lord, what will my critics think when I move in with her? One step at a time. Zarephath is next. It was three and a half years. All total, he sat with that drying book and in that widow's house. Then the word of the Lord came, said, Arise and go back to Ahab. The time to release the rain had come. Remember where we started with him? His credentials. He's the one who would stand with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. If God would make him live his whole life one step at a time, what makes me think that God will give me a road map for the next 20 years? Just because I could find the right verse to make me feel good. What makes you think you'll get it? We're talking about God's people and those who walk with the Lord. They have to walk one step at a time as you identify with God's honor and forsake yourself. It may get tiring to watch the brook dry. It may get a little bit insecure. You may wish that the birds would speak instead of feeding you sometimes, but you have to wait until God gives you the next step. I don't care what you think about me. God sometimes takes a blessing away. F.B. Myers' word tried to tell us to trust the giver, not the gift. Let me come at that from a different angle. While the land was drying up, Elijah had a brook, but because of the drying up, the brook dried up. God's blessing dwindled to nothing. God's provision, his gift, his blessing, blessing disappeared. Now, if you're going to identify God's will and God's attitude towards you with the blessings he gives you, well, if he treats us the way he treated Elijah, he's going to make that blessing disappear to teach us to trust the giver of the gift rather than the gifts that he gives us. I believe that's the hardest lesson I've ever had to learn. I struggle with it today. Not like nowadays today, like December 30th, 2023 today, like a few hours ago. It doesn't matter how many times I study this. Every time God gives a special blessing, I want it encased in bronze. So if God happens to disappear, I can go back and lay my hand on the blessing to convince myself it's okay. The blessing may have to dwindle for the faithing sinner to understand. It is not the successful job. It's not the happy relationship or children. It's not even our mental health. It's about God's people, his church that are willing to sacrifice themselves to see God's honor prevail. I'm praying right now about some things that are happening that are a little different than what I had planned. There is no blessing, no achievement, no gift of God that we ever ought to allow ourselves to identify with so much that if it's taken away, we'll quit serving. In God. You're more important to God than your spiritual gifts are. As long as that perspective is kept, may God let us praise him with our last breath before we go off to glory. I don't know what your blessing is, but when you learn from Elijah, God sometimes take the blessing away to teach us to trust the blesser. God also didn't keep him in prominence. You notice that? How long is he over here in Gilead? I don't know. How long is he in Ahab's court? One day. What's the next step? Get on the mountaintops and declare it's God's time to vindicate his word? No. It's get thee hence toward eastward and hide yourself. Go hide. How long? Three and a half years. The next message is go back to Ahab. After that, it's Mount Carmel. How long is he there? One day. Great victory occurs as he calls fire from heaven, licks up the sacrifice and the water that was poured to make it hard. He then draws the sword, slays the prophets and the priests of Baal in the groves, and then he goes to a hilltop and begins to pray for rain, even though God had said it's going to rain. Now, God did not exempt him from when he started being the active agent to pray that God would do now what he said. He continued to pray until a little tiny cloud appeared in the sky the size of a hand, and the sound of rain was in the 
the air. Next, though, he didn't wait for the next step from God. He girded his loins of his cloth around his loins and runs to Jezreel in the flesh of victory. Okay, we'll give him two days and one day on Mount Carmel, half a day running, and one day to get the bad news when he gets to Jezreel that Jezebel is unimpressed. That ungodly broad, she was unmoved by God's power. When did God tell him to run to Jezreel? I dare you to find it. He got carried away. And the fellow that had gone one step at a time, all of a sudden he's got victory in his grasp when he girds that garment around him and runs to Jezreel. So next then, and I'm sure I don't have a scripture for this, but next then God might have said to him, you like running so well, I'll give you a real reason to run. Jezebel says, I'm going to do to you what you did to those prophets. The message right here is that I want you to notice how much time he had in the limelight. A day here, a couple days there. That's it for all the years he's God served. So now he runs to a juniper tree. You know how far he ran to Jezreel up north, just over the ridge from Galilee? It was over 100 miles. He ran all the way to the southern tip of Beersheba and then took a full day's journey off into the desert south of the Dead Sea. He finds a juniper tree and lays down, and now he wants to die. God sent him an angel to bake a cake for him and got him on his feet and sent him to a hilltop. And there in privacy with God, he had one day on that mountain after 40 days of fasting following his failure. God then sent him down from the hill for 11 years to train his successor, then one more moment of prominence as the whirlwind takes him to heaven. And all that time, maybe four or five days, was all the time he got any credit for everything he did. I thought a successful man of God always had a curve of success that went up like that. If you're really in God's will, you ought to always be going up, right? I get worried about me or any other Christian unless it looks like this. That's God's way. I sometimes think that a man like this, training like this, and what he's seen and done with God could fail like he did is beyond me. He blew it. He lets a woman ruin him and runs off down to the desert and wants to cry and die. I'd want to kill him if I weren't not guilty myself of almost the exact thing and getting discouraged with God. Any of you out there had your juniper tree experience? Come on, be honest. There might be a few liars, but most of you will raise your hand. Oh my God, let me down and I'm going to really take it out on him. I'm going to want to die. Well, as long as he was strong, God fed him with birds and a widow that didn't have anything. The only time he got an angel food cake was when he failed. Think about that. I'm going to be honest with you a bit. That's where I am right now with my own life. I let my circumstances get to me. Things look pretty bleak right now. I'm one of those Americans, the one disaster away from bankruptcy and homelessness. I could have stood more, but instead I'm just where Elijah was under his juniper tree. I have friends and family like Job's friends that think this is me being punished for doing something wrong. Personally, I think this old world is throwing more nasty things at me I don't even want to think about. And God's still protecting me from those things I don't even know about, even while I'm at my lowest. I took a bit of time, but I got up eventually and started putting these videos together and finishing my book with my free time. I'm not doing it for me. This is what we can learn from Elijah about the meaning of faith. Number one, he started right where we all can and do start. He didn't get any special effects or voice of God until later. After he took the action of simply praying earnestly, believing that God does what he says he'll do, and sticking to it with confidence in God, through the doubt and fear, and all the other things the world threw at him. Number two, he hung his body on it. He walked into danger and fathed in Ahab's court without any voice from God or anything telling him to. Number three, then when God finally did speak, he didn't hesitate to do it, even if it didn't make sense to him. Number four, he waited where God put him until he got the next step. And number five, he also screwed up, and God didn't abandon him. He didn't punish him. In fact, God supported him during his despondency and failure, and then got him walking and fasting for 40 days to get him on the right path again. I can relate. Say what you will, but I think this is powerful evidence in support of my hypothesis about the meaning of faith. I had one of my mo most beloved brothers die, then I got divorced, then I lost my job, then my truck, then the roof over my head, all in a few months. Then people started telling me, like Job's friends, that I don't look or act like a Christian should, so God must be punishing me. Honestly, my voice was one of those saying that for a time. It's the normal Christian life, just like the famous Chinese theologian Watchman Nee wrote in the book of the same name. And I got an angel, a raven, right now keeping a roof over my head mostly and fed. Sometimes blessings dry up. I sat under my juniper tree for a bit, and now with my free time, I'm making these videos and finishing my book, and I honestly think a lot of people might be helped by it in 2024. We got war on three continents. Just mathematically, we're worse than the worst of the Great Depression financially right now, and it's election year.
it wouldn't surprise me one bit. A lot of us end up in the same boat this year. So yeah, I might be important to spend all this free time putting this out here. I've been putting it off, honestly. Even if I have to borrow a computer or use one at the library, even if I have to sell my blood for pennies or annoy my loved ones from time to time to keep my cell phone on so I can keep putting my resume out there half a dozen times every single day in the face of this horrendous news and state of progressivism ruining the job market right now. Even if I have to use my contacts to get credits at AWS to put all this out here. Thank God I have the year's experience to know how to do it with zero income. It's way harder. If I still had all my personal equipment, I could kick one of these videos out every other day, but I can't quit. I hope y'all watch. I hope you're watching me right now. It's like when Jesus said we have to pick up our cross and follow. You'll get to see if I'm either a nut job or what I think I am, the son and servant of the king of the universe like we all are, and we should all act like. I can't stop acting on my belief in God, and I can't stop being confident in that belief as everything falls apart and very likely gets worse. I have never had a quid pro quo relationship with God where I'll obey all your rules or you give me a good job or you keep me from falling down. That's the failing I learned from Elijah. God knew where he was taking Elijah, and God wasn't going to wipe out his whole trip just because Jezebel got to him. The only time God sent an angel to bake a cake for him was in his failure. And you and I both know that mankind would have been prone to stomp on it right then and there. Now, God didn't leave him there. Death lay ahead. Mastery lay ahead. God didn't leave Elijah chewing on angel food cake either. He fed him and he gave him mercy and he got him back on his feet. He put some spiritual discipline back in him. He made him fast for 40 days. Then he took him to a hilltop and he brought him right back to step one. There was nothing new to tell him. There's no record of any exhortation. He took Elijah back to the first benchmark. How did he start out? Wind, earthquake, and fire, special revelations? No, God's word started him out. After God gets him straightened out, 40 days walking and fasting, he puts him on a hilltop and God strengthens his resolve. How? By blowing up a storm and then shaking the earth till a mountain falls down and then burn it all up with fire. I don't know about you, but if that was me, I'd get the picture. Why am I whining about being afraid of any one person? But there's an interesting touch to this part of scripture. It keeps saying God is not in the shows of power. It says there's a wind, God's not in it. There's an earthquake, God's not in it. God wasn't in the fire. Now, sometimes he is. He was in the fire in the burning bush. What is the sanctuary? God is my sanctuary. And it was Elijah. God may or may not be in an earthquake. I could tell you a lot of places I wish he'd be in one. God may or may not be in the fire and he may not be in the wind. I'm really sure he's not in a lot of the hot wind I hear. He may or may not be in the effects of his presence, but he will always be identified with the voice of his word. That still small voice, God speaking articulate direction, and that's the safe ground for God's servants to stay in around all the gigantic strides in God. All the training, it's still one bottom line. Get yourself back to it. Thus saith a still small voice, God's words. Stay there and you make it. And if I stay there, I'll make it. He's always there when you fall. He isn't punishing you. P.S. Elijah then goes on to train his replacement. God tells him straight up who and where and what this guy, this is your replacement. And what does Elijah do? He walks up to him, tells him he's to be the next Elijah and gives him his coat. And then the new guy just left everything and follows him. That's it. That powerful testimony to our normal lives and God moving in. God didn't let this first prophet that started right where we all start disappear without arranging a simple replacement. I think to keep this example of a hero of faith from disappearing from the earth or from the record. There's a lot to this story of Elijah. The least I can do is make sure his example is still in my life.